pigeons, a familiar sight in cities all over the world. But these aren't wild birds that just happen to like city life. Most are descended from tame pigeons that escaped from captivity. But all tame or domesticated animals have got a wild ancestor. And the ancestor of our London pigeons is still around. It's a rare bird now only found nesting among remote coastal cliffs like these. It's the wild rock pigeon. It may look like our London pigeon, but certainly doesn't behave like one. It's a very shy bird. The wild rock pigeon is also the ancestor of some very special breeds of pigeons, like these fantails, with three times as many tail feathers as the wild bird. Or the capuchin, with its upturned collar of feathers. Or the dragoon, with its ugly fleshy bits, or wattles, around its beak. Then there's the pouter pigeon, which can blow itself up with air. These birds are the result of man-made evolution, of artificial selection. Occasionally, an odd-looking bird, a freak, hatches out. In the wild, such freaks rarely survive, but by keeping them alive and breeding from them, man has produced some very lovely and some very weird-looking birds. This pigeon hasn't just got out of a bath, it's been specially bred with messy feathers and it cannot fly. This bird has such a short beak, it can't even feed its own young. But the most popular of all fancy pigeons in this country must be the racing pigeon. The preparation for a pigeon race takes a lot of organising. Especially bred for their speed and homing ability, these birds can fly hundreds of kilometres, sometimes flying for 15 hours non-stop, travelling at speeds up to 65 kilometres an hour. By only allowing his best and fastest birds to mate, the owner hopes that these chicks will be even faster than their parents, because by winning races, they become extremely valuable birds. Most of man's efforts at selective breeding have been aimed at producing more food. These fruits and vegetables are effectively man-made. They're not found like this in the wild. They are the result of selective breeding from smaller and often insignificant wild ancestors. The tomato, for example, comes from plants which grow wild in South America. These wild fruits are much smaller. Improving wild plants often involves a technique called cross-pollination. The plant breeder collects the pollen from the plant that he has specially selected for breeding and transfers it to the flower of another plant, hoping to combine the good qualities of both. For example, some varieties of tomato plants with good, healthy fruit have got unhealthy roots. But this wild variety has strong, healthy roots. But there's a snag. The fruit is poisonous. And combining the two good characters isn't that easy. On the left is the plant with healthy roots but poisonous fruit. On the right, the good quality fruit, but poor, unhealthy roots. Crossing gives healthy roots, but only a few good fruit. Crossing them again gives more good fruit. Again, the roots are fine, but the fruit is still not good enough. Each improvement involves selecting the best plants from each generation. The plant is now crossed with another, equally improved like itself. 
the best of this generation are yet again crossed with one another. It takes seven processes of selection and growing from seed to combine good roots with good fruit. In Britain, we buy more than two million of these tins every day. They contain Britain's favorite tin vegetable, baked beans. But unfortunately, these beans aren't British. They have to be imported because our climate is unsuitable for growing them. It's too cold here. But the plant breeders are determined to produce a truly British bean. So they collected varieties of seeds from bean plants that grow wild in Central and South America. From this collection, they selected seeds from the plants growing in the mountains where the climate is similar to ours. They planted these beans on experimental plots of land in different parts of the country. The results were encouraging. But unfortunately, the plants that grew best here in Britain had beans of the wrong color. Black beans covered by tomato sauce taste all right, but don't look very appetizing. So now, the challenge to the plant breeders was to get a white bean. They started by crossing the black bean plant, which they now know grows so well here, with the white bean plant that doesn't grow so well. Here, the flower of the black bean plant is being prepared for cross-pollination. As bean flowers can pollinate themselves, the anthers are removed before the pollen which they produce is ripe. Only the stigma, the female part, is left. A flower from the white bean plant has already been picked. It's also being prepared for cross-pollination. It's a much older flower and the anthers contain ripe pollen. The anthers are carefully removed and are placed on the stigma of the black beaned flower. Now it's just a question of waiting to see the result of this cross-pollination. Under controlled conditions, the plants grow well. But there's a problem. The beans certainly aren't white. Clearly, the genetics of plant breeding are complicated. So, there's plenty of work ahead. The palest beans of each generation must now be grown and crossed with each other under controlled conditions. Several more crosses will have to be made before a white bean can be developed that grows well in this country. Then perhaps we'll have our very own British baked bean. The first farmers needed two things from their animals, food and clothing. Apart from their food value, sheep are important because of their wool, which can be spun and woven into cloth. But the early primitive sheep, the ancestors of these Welsh sheep, didn't have such thick woolen coats. They were probably more like these small brown primitive sheep which still live in a semi-wild state on some of the islands off the west coast of Scotland. Over the centuries, man selected and bred those sheep with thicker and better wool. 
by the Middle Ages, a huge wool industry had been built up around breeds like these Cotswold sheep. Then came disaster to the British wool industry. And it came in the shape of the Spanish Merino sheep, which have thick coats of very fine quality wool. Britain is too cold and wet for Merino sheep, but Australia isn't. Here they thrived, and the wool from Australia soon took over the wool industry. But the British wool industry wasn't completely ruined by the Australian merinos. The wool from these Scottish black-faced sheep is in great demand for making carpets. It's a very hard-wearing wool. It wasn't just the competition from Australia that affected the British wool business. People wanted meat. By carefully crossing different breeds of sheep, farmers developed the smaller, faster growing sheep that are still popular today as meat animals. The wool from these sheep is a useful byproduct. Many of the British varieties of sheep have been specially bred to live on the cold and damp hillsides where there's only poor quality grass to feed on. So, over large areas of countryside, sheep are the most important source of food. Like sheep, today's cattle are the result of centuries of selective breeding. To most of us, a cow is just a cow, milk machines or beef factories on legs. But the farmer knows and values them as different breeds like these Frisians, the most popular breed in this country because the cows produce so much milk. Or the Jersey breed, which are well known for their rich and creamy milk. But they don't give us as much milk as the Frisians. The common ancestor of all our cattle is the wild Orach. It died out in the Middle Ages, so this is just an artist's impression of what it probably looked like. In the Middle Ages, these longhorn cattle were the most popular breed. The cows provided milk for making butter and cheese. The bulls were used to pull ploughs and carts, and at the end of their working life, they were fattened for meat. They were multi-purpose animals. Breeding for better milk and better meat production didn't start until the 18th century. Early attempts produced some rather strange and unsuccessful animals. The Shorthorn became the most important breed in the country and remained popular until the Frisian breed was imported from Holland early this century. Since the 1920s, breeding programs have concentrated on better milk production, both in quality and quantity. A good Frisian cow now produces three times as much milk as she needs for her calf. She may give more than 5,000 litres of milk in a year. And with three million dairy cows around, that's a lot of milk. But a cow can't produce milk unless she has calves. Roughly half of the calves will be male and of no use to a dairy farmer, so he sells them to be fattened for beef. About four million cattle are slaughtered each year for beef. Much of the meat is sent to the Smithfield Market in London for distribution. A farmer can improve the quality of meat by cross-breeding, by mating his dairy cows with a bull that has been specially bred for beef. Top quality bulls of the most important breeds of cattle, here being exercised, are now available to farmers at artificial insemination centres throughout the country. Farmers no longer need to keep their own bulls which can be a dangerous and expensive business. 
Artificial insemination involves collecting the bull's semen, that's the fluid containing sperm, and using it to fertilize a cow. Semen is collected like this about twice a week. The semen must be taken to the laboratory for testing before it can be used to inseminate or fertilize any cows. Last year, this bull fathered about 30,000 calves. In the laboratory, the semen is tested to make sure that the sperm are still alive. Each collection of semen is diluted several times, so it can be used to fertilize more cows. The diluted semen is being put into long, thin straws. One collection of semen may produce enough sperm to fill a thousand straws. That means a thousand cows can be inseminated. Normally, sperm don't live very long, but by freezing them in a tank of liquid nitrogen, they can be kept for many years. It's on the farm that the actual insemination is carried out. All this time, the semen is kept frozen. The frozen straw is put in warm water to thaw out. A special insemination gun is needed to push the contents of the straw, the semen, into the uterus of the cow. The best bulls in the country are available to the farmer by using artificial insemination. Some farmers prefer to keep their own bull, but there's always the problem of the bull mating with its own daughters. Such inbreeding can lead to many of the good qualities of the herd being lost. The increased demand for milk and beef is why the Frisian is the most popular cattle breed today. But our future needs may change. So it's important to keep some of our older, more traditional breeds of cattle, which are no longer popular. If these rare breeds are allowed to die out, many of their valuable characteristics will be lost forever. Who knows what we may need from our farm animals in the future?